Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now... With 326 episodes made, broadcasting from 1939 to 1950, we bring to you The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Your mutual station will broadcast exclusively the American League playoff game in Boston tomorrow between the Red Sox and the Cleveland Indians. The playoff is on the air at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's tomorrow afternoon at 1.15 Eastern Time for the American League playoff on your mutual station. Now, Sherlock Holmes. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. This week's adventure, The Case of the Frightened Bookkeeper. I regret using my hunting crop on your hand, sir, but you are rather obstinate. And you are wanted for murder. I shall stop the train and we shall return to London. I shall have the pleasure of turning you over to Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. As a gift. Compliments of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, here we are again at the door of Dr. Watson's study, ready to hear another exciting story from the good doctor's memoirs. Ah, good evening, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> good evening, evening. Delighted to see you again. Uh, Dr. Watson, which of your spine tingling adventures with Mr. Holmes do we hear about tonight? Well, it's the case of the frightened bookkeeper, Mr. Harris. It confirmed a murder under fantastic circumstances, and it ended with the strangest doings in a court of law that I have ever witnessed. Well, Doctor, two things always amaze me. Uh, Mr. Holmes' case is for one, and for uh, another... May I venture to guess that the other source of your amazement has to do with Clipper Craft clothes? It certainly does, Dr. Watson. If you think a really fine suit should cost you a young fortune, why, you'll be glad to know you're wrong. Absolutely wrong. Because you can own a suit that looks like an expensively tailored model without going haywire. Impossible? Well, just flip into a Clipper Craft suit. Study the tailoring, examine the fabric. Don't think you can afford it? Well, then glance at the price tag. No, your eyes aren't playing you a trick. The price is only 40 or 47.50. You wonder how it's done? Well, listen. More than 1,200 of this country's finest independent stores, from Maine to California, have combined their vast purchasing power to keep your budget happy. That's why you'll pay only 47.50 for the handsome Clippercraft worsted suit you'll hardly ever wear out. Try one on at the Clippercraft store in your community. You're bound to agree. Clippercraft values in suits, top coats, and sport coats are flabbergasted. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many, many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, just what was the frightened bookkeeper afraid of? This story, Mr. Harris, begins shortly after nine in the morning on Lombard. The customary swarm of office workers was dashing about, but no one was hurrying quite as quickly as our bookkeeper, Mr. Humphrey Littleton. He scurried across the street like a startled rabbit and ran into the overseas bank. He raced across the vast marble floor to the cubicle in a far corner. There, he hastened to hang his coat on a hook and wipe his perspiring brow. Then, he mounted his tall stool and opened a huge letter. Mr. Littleton, yes, Mr. Mason. I presume you realize that you are late. Yes, Mr. Mason, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. To be precise, Mr. Littleton, you are 18 minutes late. Yes, sir. I believe, Mr. Littleton, this is the first time in 21 years that you have been late. That is correct, Mr. Mason. The bank is shocked. I know, sir. I presume there is some reasonable explanation for this unfortunate parent. Oh, there is, sir. It's the bell. What now. bell? If you step to the window with me, sir, then I can explain. The window? Please. Oh, very well. 
Now, sir, if you look across the way at the crowd in front of the merchant's building... What of it? It's the old bell. The bell on top of the building. It didn't ring this morning, sir. First time in years. And what concern is it of yours? Well, you see, Mr. Mason, I always stop for my breakfast down the street. I always pride myself by listening to the bell, but it didn't ring this morning. And that's why I was late. Well, Mr. Lin... Ooh, I say. What on earth are those policemen doing? It appears as though they are carrying something, doesn't it? It's a man. They're carrying someone out of the building on a stretcher. Oh, an accident, no doubt. Oh, say, they're covering his face with a blanket. He must be dead. And isn't that Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard out there? I have never met the gentleman. Of course it is. Oh, he's coming into the bank. Now we shall see what's what and who's been killed. <laughs> Mr. Littleton. Yes, Mr. Mason. May I present Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard? I'm happy to make your acquaintance, Inspector. How do you do? Mr. Littleton. You were late this morning because the bell on the top of the Mercer's building failed to strike the hour of nine. Yes, Mr. Mason. Inspector Lestrade informed me that the bell did not strike because something had fallen into the mechanism. Do you know what it was? I haven't the remotest idea. It was a dead body. Really? It was the body of a Mr. Henry Bennett. Henry? Mr. Bennett was murdered. What? You committed the murder, Mr. Littleton. I? Well, I... You were late because you did not simply stop for breakfast. You also stopped to do away with Henry Bennett. Humphrey Littleton, you're under arrest. No, no, I didn't. You can't arrest me. Oh. You can't. Keep him away, Snacker, or Inspector. Thank you. Keep the gun there. Why, that's I funny. have a gun. Now, out of my way, or I'll shoot you. You haven't a chance, Littleton. We'll find you. I don't think so, Inspector. I'll take my coat if you don't mind. Don't call to your men. I can still see you very well. If you budge or say a word, I shall kill you. Oh, I never thought he had it in him. Mr. Littleton, the murderer. And now we'll have to search all London for the rascal. Stop that man. Stop him, I say. Up, friend! Up, friend! I'll answer it, Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Oh, good morning, Inspector Lestrade. Mr. Holmes, well, Lestrade, what information do you wish to impart? Aside from the fact that you've found a cadaver in a small, inaccessible area, that you've lost a prisoner, and that you're desperately anxious to discuss the case. Holmes, the inspector's hardly said a word. How do you know what this is all about? He's hardly said a word, my dear Watson, but his appearance is most eloquent. Is it, Mr. Holmes? Indeed. You've ducked on the knees of your trousers and the elbows of your coat, indicating clearly that you've been squirming about in an area that's barely accessible. You've found a corpse, since a considerable number of woolen threads are on your jacket. They are the distinctive colored threads found on the blanket used by the coroner when placing dead bodies in his wagon. Mark them. Your complexion is livid and your breath. You have therefore been running. Surely not in haste to pay us a social call. Rather, I should say, in pursuit of someone. And the manner in which you're nervously fingering your notebook, Inspector, can only signify that you're impatient to discuss the case. Pray discuss it then. Understand, Mr. Holmes. I'm telling you this because you have been somewhat helpful on previous occasions. A masterpiece of understanding. I'm not asking your assistance. It's just if you should come across anything that should be brought to my attention. Now then, our information is fragmentary. Perhaps I may embellish it. We found a corpse lying across the mechanism of the gigantic bell on top of the merchant's building on Lombard Street. Well, who was the dead man? A Mr. Henry Bennett. Bennett. Bennett, yes, I have a card on him. Who is he, Holmes? Oh, a petty thief, tiresome record of criminal trivia, served a few short prison terms, a bit of flotsam on the sea of the London underworld. Bennett's skull was split open. We found the weapon. It was a walking stick with a cast iron top. A walking stick? We couldn't fathom where it came from, but a, a girl in the crowd recognized it. She's a secretary at the overseas bank across the way. The bank had presented the walking stick to one of its bookkeepers. It was a memento of 20 years' service. And the bookkeeper's name? Humphrey Littleton. Find anything else? Yes. There's a letter on the body. Obviously a blackmail note. Addressed to Humphrey Littleton. Well, how does the note read? Uh, it said, Merchant Building, Tuesday morning, bring usual payment, be sure you keep mum. It's called in pencil. What he signed for? Any eyewitness? Two of his fellow employees saw Littleton leave the Merchant Building. You then crossed the street and entered the bank and attempted to arrest Humphrey Littleton, but he escaped. Am I correct, this time? Yes, yes, Mr. Holmes, he vanished. He took a gun from the cashier's drawer, forced his way past him. Evidently, the little bookkeeper was tired of being blackmailed by Bennett, so he did away with him. Yes, but how did the body get into the mechanism of the bell, Inspector Lestrade? Uh, Littleton met his man in the building this morning, struck him on the head, killing him instantly, dragged the body to the roof. He intended to push it off, so 
we believe Bennett had fallen or committed suicide. Well, that's all very well, but you still haven't explained I, I, I'm to... coming to that, Dr. Watson. The killer must have been startled by a noise and believed he was about to be caught, seen by someone on the roof, chimney sweep perhaps. There's a trap door on the roof that leads to the bell. Littleton must have dropped him there when he became afraid, lest he wouldn't have time to push him off the roof. Anything further you wish to state for the No, no. Now I must be off. I, I don't suppose you'll have occasion to do so, Mr. Holmes, but if you should come across a clue as to the whereabouts of Littleton, you might tell the yard. The son, I leave the solution of this case entirely in your capable hands. It will rest well there, Mr. Holmes. I've no doubt, the son. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Good morning. Mr. Well, confounded, Holmes, you're not just going to sit there while Inspector Lestrade steals a march on you. A bit of it, my dear Watson. I'm merely giving him time to leave. The moment he's sufficient to car away, we're off to the overseas bank. We shall see if we come to locate Mr. Humphrey Littleton, the frightened bookkeeper. Perhaps we may shake straws on the tail of this bird who's flown the cage. <laughs> This is the photograph of Mr. Littleton, Mr. Holmes, from our file. Ah, yes, Mr. Mason. And uh, this is the cage where he works, Mr. Mason. Yes, Dr. Watson. I see. Holmes, what are you doing crawling about on the floor? Uh, Mr. Mason, when he made his escape, you say he seized the revolver from the drawer, then his coat hanging on that hook, then left the bank. Exactly. I don't know how on earth he'll ever be found in all of London. Aha. Found something, Holmes? This pink pill is rolled under the desk. And this microscopic bit of green paper... Note the geometric design of the paper. Both items are most informative. Pill, green paper? Uh, that copy of the Evening Star on the desk, Watson, please. Oh, first you find the pill, and then you want to read the newspaper. What are you up to, Holmes? Ah, there we are. It's safe. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Come, Watson. Mr. Mason, we shall have the killer in a jiffy. But, 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 Holmes, is No time, Watson, to... no time. Good morning, Mr. Mason. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Good morning. Uh, where are we off, sir, Holmes? Victoria Station, as quickly as a Campbell carrier. And why, may I ask? Because, my dear Watson, it's there that we shall find Mr. Humphrey Littleton, if they're not too late. We shall find him with the aid of this pink pill and the geometrically designed stack of green paper. <laughs> The most fortunate, Watson, train Mr. Littleton has chosen for his departure to the continent is still here at the station. Come along, I'll purchase his ticket for us. We'll record it. Well, but what train? How do, how do you know all this? The answer is the pink pill I discovered in his cage at the bank. I recognized it immediately. Its mate is missing. There's a pink pill and a brown pill. Ingredients, a form of butyl alcohol, tyrosine bromide, and caffeine. More commonly known as seasick pill. Well, I see. The pill fell from Littleton's pocket when he lifted his coat from the hook. Pill. By George, he was preparing for a sea voyage. Wasn't it brilliant, my dear Watson? Yes, our bookkeeper was prepared to bolt from the clutches of his blackmailer to abandon his position at the bank. He was preparing for a sea voyage, timid so that he is, by securing pills. Escape, Watson. All right, you are. Thank you, sir. But um, why did you read the Evening Star? To examine the travel section. Not a single passenger ship sails today for a far-off port. There are simply the regular daily sailings across the channel to France. Of course, I had to fortify this clue with more tangible evidence. The uh, particle of green paper? Easily identifiable. It is a familiar green paper utilized for the printing of railway tickets. As for the neat pattern of it, it was definitely the portion punched out by the ticket seller. The railways maintain an infallible system of tracing those punch mark buttons. Each punch has a peculiar design of its own. I was quite correct in surmising that Littleton was headed across the channel via Victoria Station. His tickets for the train to Dover, the train we are about to board. Uh, shall we? Uh, this compartment? So the agent then. I say, Holmes, do you expect the killer in this compartment? Yes, I realize it's empty now, but he'll arrive most assuredly. All right, step in, Watson. Step in. Oh, thank you. Oh, um, by the by, while I was waiting at the gate, I glanced at the newspaper, Holmes. There's an item about this crime. The eminent counselor, Mr. Francis Ridgway, upon being informed of it, has volunteered to defend Littleton without a fee. Really? No, I... This is an extremely dangerous method of dealing with a killer. I told him for an evening, and he isn't aboard. You must have made an error in your deduction. Impossible. We're moving. Yes, and someone's out there trying to jump on. Open the door, Watson. Oh, right, Watson. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd never make it. Uh, are you gentlemen going to Dover? Yes. And you? To Dover. The Lieutenant Steamer. Well, since we've a journey of two hours together, perhaps we should introduce ourselves. This is Dr. John Watson. How do you do? 
My name is Sherlock Holmes. What is your name, sir? What is your name, sir? Bartholomew. George Bartholomew. I beg your pardon. Your name is Thompson Littleton, and you're wanted in London for committing murder. <laughs> Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes was brazenly inviting disaster in Calendar, the arm killer, wasn't he? Ah, uh, he certainly was, Mr. Hennis. But at this point, I have an invitation for you concerning a much more pleasant topic. Won't you tell us more about Clippercraft clothes? Well, I accept the invitation gladly, Doctor. One of these days, you're going to walk into the Clippercraft store in your community and walk out wearing a happy smile and a handsome suit by Clippercraft. You'll pay only forty or forty-seven fifty, depending on your choice. But you'll deserve all the admiration your friends will voice, because yours will be an investment in one of America's greatest clothing values. Yes, Clippercraft is just about the finest clothing value America can offer you. You see, more than twelve hundred fine stores from coast to coast have concentrated their enormous buying power to really put the brakes on your high cost of living. Why, it's clear as daylight that a project of Clippercraft's scope keeps Clippercraft's great tailoring plants operating at full speed the full year round. You get the savings this money-saving plan makes possible. Yes, Clippercraft suits are phenomenal values at only 40 and 47 50. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and sport jackets. In Manhattan, John Warner Make a Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Presby, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. <laughs> Shall we return to the frightened book, kid, on Mr. Harris? Well, we can't return to that train fast enough for me, Dr. Watson. Well, you remember that Holmes and I were in the compartment of the Dover train face to face with Humphrey Littleton, the murderer. Holmes had just identified him. What, what makes you think that I'm Littleton? Suppose you answer one question, sir. Would you leave this train and return to London in our custody? Or do you choose to be stubborn? I'll not return to London. I'll take that revolver, Mr. Littleton. You'll not take me back. I repeat. Your revolver. No. You're behaving like an idiot. London's most brilliant criminal attorney, Mr. Francis Ridgway, has announced he will defend you greatest. He has never lost a case. You've an excellent chance. No. No, I won't. I won't. Oh, don't be silly, man. You've no possible avenue of escape. Scotland Yard has surely telegraphed the French surety. I'm waiting, Mr. Littleton. Turn over your revolver. No. Once I surrender to you, I'm finished. I'd rather kill both of you. Once you're out of the way, I can jump off the train. Then what? Dashing from village to village? How long can you hide out on the downs like a stricken animal? You shan't persuade me. My mind is made up. I'll take my chances. Very well. If you insist upon... <laughs> He's missed. He's gone, Watson. I, I haven't heard. I regret the necessity of using my hunting crop on your hand, Mr. Littleton, but you are rather obstinate. I shall stop the train and we shall return to London. Then I shall have the pleasure of turning you over to Inspector Lestrade as a gift. With the compliments of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, Holmes, the morning newspapers say that Littleton is safely locked in prison. I must say you handled that case with astonishing speed. I've, I've hardly even had time to catch my breath, and it's over. It's not over. Uh, what do you mean, it isn't over? I'd say from the moment the murder was committed, events moved with a relentless logic. And hardly employ the word logic, my dear Watson. That's what disturbs me. So hurry, finish your breakfast. We're off to the merchant's building. But why, Holmes? To visit Mr. Francis Ridgway, counsel for Littleton's defense. Well, why? To ascertain how he plans to defend the bookkeeper. Well, it should be a simple, speedy trial, shouldn't it? Perhaps. <laughs> I'm delighted that you've dropped in here to my office, Mr. Holmes, and Dr. Watson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ridgway. It is an incredibly exquisite office. Those draperies, magnificent rugs, post-striking. Don't you agree, Holmes? Yes, yes, quite. 
May I ask, Mr. Ridgway, what sort of defense you plan for Humphrey Littleton? Well, there isn't a scrap of evidence on his behalf, Mr. Holmes, and he admits he was being blackmailed by the dead man. You see, uh, Littleton once needed money desperately for his wife, who was ill. He took some from the bank and juggled his books to cover up. Bennett knew about it, but Littleton denies committing the murder. Says he was never on the roof of the merchant's building. Says his walking stick was stolen from his flat. No one will believe him, I'm afraid. I don't suppose you've learned anything that would help me, have you? No, I have not. To make matters worse, he bought that ticket to France. He claimed he wanted to chuck his position and run away just to avoid the blackmailer. The jury will interpret it as a plan for escaping after committing murder. Oh, I shall paint as stirring a picture as I can of the miserable creature. Hounded by a petty thief, he, he became fed up, that's about all. I shall fight every inch of the way, but confidentially, this may be the first case I've ever lost. It's two in the morning, Holmes. Where the dickens have you been? I couldn't wait for you to return from the hospital, Watson. My mission was urgent. Yes, but where were you? I've been searching for evidence that might interest Mr. Ridgway. Oh, and did you go on this urgent mission carrying that pair of shoes under your arm? I did not start out on a mission that way, no. Really, you do perform the most extraordinary antics. Why the this pair of... trial begins tomorrow. You mean you've got something that might acquit the bookkeeper? The grim fascination of a trial for homicide, Watson, is that the results are most unpredictable. Silence! Silence! Mr. Court! Here you are, Holmes. Two seats. There's Mrs. in the dock. See him and Francis Ridgway in the far corner? Quiet, Watson. The park of your size is about to read the indictment of the jury. Gentlemen of the jury... The prisoner at the bar, Humphrey Littleton, is indicted, and the charge against him is murder. Upon this indictment, he has been arraigned. Upon his arraignment, he has pleaded that he is not guilty, and has put himself upon his country, which country you are. It is for you to inquire whether he be guilty or not, and to hearken to the evidence. The Crown charges that on the morning of July 19th, Henry Bennett was ruthlessly attacked and died instantaneously when he was struck upon the skull by... Mr. Francis Ridgway! Good heavens! Silence. Sit down, Holmes! What the... Silence in the court! Mr. Holmes, what is the reason for this disturbance? May it please your lordship, gentlemen of the jury. Henry Bennett was not murdered by Humphrey Littleton, the prisoner in the dock, but by Mr. Francis Ridgway, counsel for the defense. Silence! Silence! May it please your lordship, I do not know why Mr. Holmes has chosen to interject this fantastic One assertion. One moment, my... Mr. Ridgway. Mr. Holmes. My lord. You have, on many of previous occasions, made a substantial contribution to the enforcement of law and order. The court will entertain a statement. I protest, your lordship. Go on, Mr. Holmes, tell them. Tell them I didn't do it. I didn't do it. God help me, I didn't do it. Silence! The court will entertain a statement by Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Ridgway, it originally struck me as curious that a counsel possessing your perfect record should volunteer for a case so obviously doomed to defeat. Could it have been that you wanted to have the case because you wanted to lose it? Idle speculation. I visited your office to develop my theory. Dr. Watson admired your greatly. But I noticed a black spot on your rug. It was tar. Although you may have vigorously cleaned the remainder of your office, you neglected to remove that one speck. Oh, go on, Holmes, go on. Where did the tar come from, Mr. Ridgway? Well, the murder was committed on an extremely hot day. On the roof of the merchant's building, the tar melted. It came off on your shoes. After killing Bennett on the roof, you returned to your office soiling your rug. Preposterous. Conjecture on your part, sir. Last night, I was on the roof of the merchant's building. I made plaster cuts of the killer's footprints. I then paid a midnight visit to your deserted office, Mr. Ridgway. I found a pair of your shoes in a closet. The cuts, which I'm prepared to submit as evidence, match your footprints perfectly. Inconclusive evidence. Utterly inconclusive. In addition, in addition, I took a sample of the tar from that same roof and compared it with a sample from the tar on your rug. I have here a report based on experimentation at home. To the effect that both samples match perfectly in chemical content. Proof. I demand proof, sir, that I actually committed the murder. And you shall have it. There is a young gentleman waiting outside at my request. His name is Bob Dexter. 
What is most important about this young gentleman, however, is not his name. It is his occupation. Mr. Dexter is a chimney sweep. My friend, Inspector Lestrade, teaches is correct. There was a noise that startled the killer. It was a chimney sweep. Mr. Holmes, do you request that the witness be summoned now? In a moment, my lord. I made inquiry. I found this young gentleman at his home in Stepney. I persuaded him that accepting your bride to keep silent, Mr. Ridgway, was a disgraceful crime. He is prepared to testify that he overheard your angry conversation with Bennett upon the roof. Mr. Holmes, what was the subject of the conversation? My lord, the conversation revealed that while Bennett was in prison, he secured information from his fellow prisoners. From your victims, Mr. Ridgway, your dupes who served while your clients were cut free. Once released, Bennett patiently gathered cancelled checks, notes, photographs, overwhelming evidence about your career. Your brilliant career was founded upon a tissue of lies. Bribery, forgery, coercion. You invited Bennett to the building to purchase his collection. But you killed him with Littleton's walking stick, which you'd stolen to be sure the evidence pointed to the helpless bookkeeper. Now, shall we call Mr. Dexter? We saw you do away with Bennett. <laughs> May it please your lordship, I should like to make a request. Proceed, Mr. Ridgway. I move that the indictment against Mr. Humphrey Littleton be stricken from the record. And a new indictment be drawn up by the grand jury charging the murder of Henry Bennett and Mr. Francis Ridgway. <laughs> by Jove Holmes, now that you're relaxed in your chair with your pipe, you must take the time to tell me precisely what did happen on the morning of the murder. I, I confess I'm still a bit puzzled. It's painfully obvious, Watson. Bennett was blackmailing both the bookkeeper and Mr. Ridgway. Ridgway knew it, Littleton didn't. Ridgway sent a message to the bookkeeper, enticing him to the merchant's building that morning. He'd previously stolen the walking stick. I see. But before the bookkeeper was due to arrive, Ridgway killed Bennett with Littleton's walking stick. Then Littleton came along, innocently enough, expecting merely to make his regular, insignificant payment to Bennett. He saw a crowd, became frightened, and dashed off to work at the bank. Well, I'm still amazed at how you arrived at the proper solution. Confounded, Holmes, how do you do these things? Elementary, my dear Bob. Elementary. Well, Dr. Watson, the case of the frightened bookkeeper was really very surprising. I'm sure you've an equally shopping adventure plan for next week. Yes, Mr. Harris, I have. It's called The Adventure of the Guy Fox Society, a secret cult whose membership consisted entirely of fanatics devoted to one of the most horrible purposes imaginable. Of course, nothing on earth could keep home from joining the society. Well, Dr. Watson, we shall be standing impatiently at the door of your study next week for The Adventure of the Guy Fox Society. The makers of Clifford Craft Clothes and more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Luckman. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Ian Martin. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in... The Adventure of the Guy Fawkes Society. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. With your dial set at 710, you're all set for Behind the Front Page with Gabriel Heater, which follows in just a moment. It's Eastern Airlines for double dependability. Eastern planes are the world's finest. It's pilots tried and proven through years of service. 
Fly Eastern, the dependable airline. This is WOR, New York. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.